this is a very, this is a very powerful scripture. I'll uh, be honest with you. This, this scripture is countercultural. Jesus is getting ready to teach something that is the exact opposite of everything that everybody in this room, you grew up in America, you've been in America for longer than a week. What we're getting ready to read is counterculture to everything that you have seen, taught, learned, and potentially everything that you're doing in every aspect of your life may be impacted by what I'm getting ready to read. Matter of fact, this is one of those things that it is a life-changing scripture. It changes everything. Nobody was talking about this stuff like Jesus is talking about it before Jesus or after Jesus. Amen? So, so let, let's read this. He says, now this is Jesus. Just give you a little bit, of back, a little bit of context. This is Jesus and his disciples. They're traveling and walking around from place to place. And, and Jesus is getting ready to start reminding them because he's already told them a couple of times that he has to die, that he has to, that he has to move on. And he says, behold, we are, this is Jesus speaking, we are going up to Jerusalem, giving them some direction, and the Son of Man, talking about Jesus, will be betrayed to the, will be betrayed to the chief priest. <laughs> Ironically, this betrayal to the chief priest ultimately is going to be the people closest to him, right? He says he's going to be betrayed to the chief priest. This, is, this will be Judas. This will be all the people who are close to him who did not come to his rescue and to the scribes, they're going to hand them over. You remember the kiss, the, 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 the money in exchange and all that kind of stuff. He says, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentile, the Romans. He said, what's going to happen is, got to get this. He's saying, this, all this is getting ready to happen, that the son of man, the Christ, that these people who, I, who should have received me, that they are going to get rid of me because what I'm teaching, it makes their agenda kind of not make sense, right? And he says that they're going to give me over to the scribes and, and these priests, and then guess what's going to happen? I, I'm going to be condemned to death, and it, then, then the Romans are going to actually kill me, crucify me, and they will mock him, talking about Jesus, and scourge him and spit on him. Lord have mercy, spit on him and kill him. This, Jesus is saying, hey, this is what's going to happen. He says, and the third day, he will rise again. He starts to talk about the resurrection, all right? He says, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do, do for us whatever we ask. Isn't that how we pray to Jesus? Just do whatever I ask. Just give me whatever I want. And he said to them, what, what, what do you want me to, to do for you? And they said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left hand in your glory, that you're going to appoint us to the highest levels in your glory, that you're going to raise us up, that you're going to make us the greatest of all time. We'll be right there with you. You can be up top. We'll be on the next tier. We'll honor you. We'll give you all the glory. Just raise us up as high as you can raise us. Make us the greatest of all time. That's what he says. He says, but Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? He's talking about all that stuff he talked about earlier, the beating, the being spat on. He said, Can you, you want to be great? Can you do all that kind of stuff? He said, and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. They said to him, we are able. Yeah, sure, give it to me. We're able. We can do it. So Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink. Every one of you going to die for this. And with the baptism... I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. It belongs to God. And it's, he says, but it is for those for whom it is prepared. It's for the people who actually earned it. I can't just give it away because you asked for it. He says, and when the ten heard it, the other disciples, they began to be greatly displeased. Most versions, most versions of the Bible say they became indignant. They were angry that they would ask to be put above everybody else with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles, Lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. The Roman government, the Roman guards, how they beat people, tax people, do all these things. He says, yet it shall not be so among you. 
We, we got to do something different, Christian. Somebody say we got to do something different. We got to do something different. He says, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Let, let us pray. Father God, we come to you now in the name of your Son, Yeshua the Christ God. We come praying and believing in your word, which is so powerful, God which convicts us to our spirit, and it begins to show us a different picture than anything we've ever learned before. God, your word says that the greatest among us are the people who serve others, not the people who rule over others. Your word says that the greatest of, uh, of, of among us are those who put others first, who become a slave, who become second to many. And so, God, it is my prayer that you remove the confirmation of the world, which has taught us over and over again that we should do for self. We should lift self up. We should have self-ambition. All that self stuff, God, we're praying right now that you begin to break that hold on our life and that you begin to speak into our heart and begin to show us what it means to have the humility of Christ. And I'm praying, God, that marriages will be restored that parent relationships will be destroyed, that, that sibling relationships and all types of family and work relationships, and even that this whole nation will be restored through the seed that will be planted in the hearts of the people today, which will grow a spirit of humility. And we pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And to God be the glory. Amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We've been in this series uh, called Love Matters. Uh, we've been going through this series. We've, got, we've gone through several very challenging sermons. Uh, I believe that today will, will probably be a little less challenging because most of the people I know or have encountered, you're not selfish, right? You don't want your own way, right? You don't want things to go your way. You're not always thinking about yourself. So this may actually go over, over our heads today uh, unless we take some time and begin to look at ourselves through a different set of eyes. You've heard the story. We, we've already gone through this story. I want you to be able to understand this story and give you a little bit more context about this story. Jesus and his disciples are on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus is, is very clearly explained to them that this whole situation is about to happen. What's about to happen? He is about to be killed and He's about to be beaten and spat on. He kind of go through it with, with detail. They're going to scourge him, meaning they're going to do some of the most despicable things that you can imagine to a human. That This is getting ready to happen. Jesus is confirming what Isaiah talks about and what many of the Old Testament prophets speak about throughout the time. Daniel talks about this a lot as well. He talks about this king that is going to come, that's going to go through this, this process where he's going to be killed. Isaiah talks about this as well. And through the process of him being killed, he is going to be resurrected. And when he comes back, he's going to have this power. He's going to rule over Zion, right? He's going to become this most, this most powerful being. The greatest of all time is what, he, what he's going to become. He's going to become this being that is going to have power. He's going to put the Roman Empire, or any empire, evil in general, into his, pl into his place. And you've got to imagine this from the perspective of the disciples that would have been with him. These disciples, all of them would have grown up under the rulership of the Roman government. And all of them would have constantly been being told about what, you know, we would have called them fables. But this would have been like literally scripture out of the Bible where they've been being told that eventually there's going to be this, this savior that's going to come, this Christ this Messiah that's going to come, the Son of Man, that's what he called it. That's what it was called. That's what it had been called throughout their teaching, that the Son of Man is going to show up, and the Son of Man is going to go through this situation, and the Son of Man is going to rise from this situation, and the Son of Man is going to become the greatest of all time. He's going to be a ruler of all rulers, Lord of lords, King of kings. This is the kind of thing that they would have been hearing about their entire life. Can you imagine being a child who has been taught that you serve the one and only true Yahweh, the God of God, that he, he rules and super rules over every single thing, but yet and still, you're a slave. 
You're sitting inside of a, of, of a country in which you are considered to be a secondhand citizen, where people are unfairly treating you. They're unfair. They beat you up. They take your money. They do all these mean things to you. They hurt you. But yet and still, you're being told that you are a child of the Most High God. I want you to kind of see this from, from James and John's perspective, because they are in a position where all of a sudden they believe the prophecy is about to happen. They believe what Jesus says, that he's getting ready to go up. Up, and he's getting ready to be scourged and he's getting ready to go through this painful death and that uh, after three days of being buried he's going to rise and when he come out they're, they're believing when he comes out of the tomb that he's going to have all this power in his hands and it's going to be earthly power it won't be heavenly power they don't have any idea they're not thinking about eternal life they're not thinking about any of the things that we know about today we're we're looking at the story two thousand years later and what they're thinking about is Jesus is about to go through this experience that's going to propel him into this leadership. And he's going to set up this entire leadership type, ruling type uh, structure. He's going to rule on Zion is what Daniel said. He's going to have power over everything. And the only thing that they can think about is, you know, how can, how can I become the greatest of all time? If you could have seen him. They're both wearing a shirt that looks like this right here. They want to be the GOAT. They want to be the greatest of all time. They want to be the best. They want to be, listen, they don't care anything. They understand. They respect God. They respect Jesus. They understand that there's a hierarchy. But in understanding that there's a hierarchy, they're asking Jesus this very selfish thing. They're asking Jesus this very self-centered they're not thinking about what, what's going to happen to him. They don't turn to Jesus and say, oh, my goodness, you're going to be scourged? Somebody's going to spit on you? You would imagine if you're in a conversation with somebody, somebody that you loved, and they said to you, people are going to beat me up, people are going to spit on me, people are going to hurt me, people are going to kill me. You would have imagined that your closest friends, they got to think about this now, These are this is Jesus and his closest people. And you got to imagine that if you with your crew and you talking about, man, I'm getting ready to get laid off. I'm getting ready. To, this thing about to happen. I'm getting ready. I think I got this. Can I think I got this thing going on in my body. I got this issue that I can't. I'm losing my family. I'm losing my wife. You would imagine that somebody would have looked at Jesus and said, oh, my goodness, what can we do to prevent this? How can we help you? How do we how do we stand beside you? How do we support you? How do we lift you up? We love you. This is what people in love do. But instead they immediately begin to think about how is this going to affect me? Yeah. You've been around people like that that's supposed to love you and you go through a situation in your life and you can hear inside of their comments they're beginning to think about, okay, what we do next? Well, you, you, you lost this thing. How are we going to continue to live? How are we going to continue to pay this? How, who's going to be my boss now? Who's going to be the person that's going to be over me? Who's going to take care of me now? Instead of them focusing, love would require you to focus on the person that is hurting to put somebody above yourself, James and John sees this as an opportunity to become the greatest of all time. They want to be the GOAT, man. They, they say, okay, Jesus, you can be at the top, but just put us at the second tier. You, you can be at the very top. Listen, we'll praise you. We'll give you everything. But we want you to take us up to the highest level. And, and if you begin to just think about this for a second, because it becomes very easy to condemn James and John. It becomes very easy to begin to look at them and think, I would never do that. I would never want to do that. But, but here's the reality of it. This is, this is a true fact. That, that many of us, we get to this place where we want to be first. We, we get to this place where we want to be just like they. All they want to do is be first. Only thing they're asking Jesus, they Jesus, do for us what we ask. Many of us go to Christ. Many of us go to God in prayer. And our prayer is just as selfish as you could ever imagine. God, help me. God, lift me up. God, protect me. God, give me. God, fix this. God, change this. God, direct me. God, order my steps. God, do this thing for me. So, so many times we, we have these James and John tendencies where we get to this place where we want God to elevate us so that we can be recognized. We want people to see us. We want people to understand. You know, you want to do something nice and nothing wrong with that. But, but you also want to be complimented for doing something nice. It's not just the act of doing something nice, but many times we have these James and John qualities, these selfish ambition qualities that make us want to be recognized for the stuff that we do. 
do. We want to be important many times. This is on the inside of you. James and John, they're not the only people who want to be important. They're not the only people who want to be first. They're not the only people who want to be recognized. They're not the only people who want attention, who want people to pay attention to their needs, to understand their perspective, to understand my plight, my issue, what's going on with me. In some instances, we get to this place where this selfish ambition, we really just want to be powerful. We really just want to be in control. We want to be the one who's telling everybody what to do, when to come, how to do it, when not to do it. And we do not want to give that to anybody else. We get to this place. If, we, if we're not careful, this selfish ambition, it, it causes us to want to control every single thing and every person. And, and this is what I have for you to think about today. It's not just a James and John quality, but on the inside of each and every one of us is this exact same quality. And this this thing is showing up in all of our marriages. It's showing up in all of our marriages that when we're in a marriage, we want to be first. We don't want the other person to be first. We in a marriage, we want to want, want to put ourselves on top. In a marriage, we want to be recognized. We want to do something for the husband. We want to do something for the wife. But we want somebody to. We want them to say, "Hey, you look what you look what you did for me, right?" In a marriage, we want to be important. Want to feel like we're important. Want the other person to understand us. In a marriage, we want attention. It needs to be on us. The attention always has to be on us. We want power and control. And this same list of things, it shows up in all relationships. It shows up in parenting relationships. You, you have ch children who want to be first, who want their parents to recognize them, who want to be important, be considered important, who want all the attention, who want all the power, who want all the control. And you have parents who have the same thing. I'm your daddy. I'm your mama. I'm first. I'm older. I'm stronger. You need to recognize me. Mother's Day, Father's Day. What you come here with this mess for? I need some real gifts. Importance. You want to be important. You want them to see you as somebody. I could, mama, I couldn't have made it through this life without you. All the credit, not God. You know, it's not, you know, it's not about God. It's, you just want to be up at the top. You okay with them saying a little bit about God and how God did some things and how God opened some doors. But, but you want mothers, you want fathers, you want them to say, I couldn't have made it without you, God. God gave me you as a, yeah. this stuff shows up at, at work. You, you got people at work. This is what they want to be first. They don't, they don't care. You know, we use these old, old Baptist terms. They backbite, dig ditches, and all that kind of stuff. Y'all remember that old stuff. They want to be first. They want to be recognized. They want to be important and will do anything. Yeah. And will run the bus over you and back up over you and back up over you again and again just to get attention, just to get power, just to get control. And if you just, if you just stop for a second and begin to just look, You've seen this stuff rampant all around you, but here's the reality. It's not just all around you. This thing is, 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 is in you. We're born, this is what Paul begins to communicate to us. We're all born with this need to be first. We're all born. It's not just a societal thing. I know we are in hyperdrive in this society. There's a lot in this society, a lot of talk about being first, about pulling yourself up from your bootstrap, about being number one. There's a lot of number one, but listen, there's only one number one. There's a lot of talk in this society about selfish ambition, putting yourself first, pushing other people down, being number one at no cost. That is the society that we're in. But you need to understand it's not just a societal thing. This thing that we see in John and James, this thing is inside of each one of us. It says the acts of the flesh are obvious. What's happening on the inside of you is obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, and check this out, selfish ambition. You wanted to be number one is in the same. You thought that you were just, you were clean and saved when you stopped doing this immorality and this impurity and you stopped doing all this idolatry and whatever, for any of you that are doing this kind of witchcraft stuff, you stopped doing this stuff. You thought you had wiped the slate clean when you stopped hating people and stopped sowing discord and stopped being jealous. You thought you had it all together when you started handling your rage, but you forgot one thing. Selfish ambition is in this list. 
And, and what he's saying is, if you're doing everything just so you can get what you want, just so you can control, just so you can say, hey, I'm number one, just so you can say, I'm the GOAT, I'm the greatest of all time. If you're just trying to be the greatest of all time, just to lift yourself up, you miss the entire thing. And what Paul begins to communicate to us, that this is, listen, this is a part of what's inside of you. Like, you're fighting against all these things all the time. And sometimes some of these things are winning inside of your life. And what Paul is saying, inside of that list of things that you are fighting to try to be a, a better person, try and be more like Christ, you have to add everything that you're doing to get your way. Everything that you're doing to get control of everybody. Everything that you're doing so that you're in charge, so that it's your way or the highway. I mean, you know, these are the kind of things that we say in our society. And this is sometimes what people, you're going to do it my way or you're going to get out of this house. You've had people say stuff like that to you because this selfish ambition, not only is it, is it prevalent in our society, but it's, take, it's taking over our society. Like, like, like nobody is putting up, nobody's being directed. Where, where do you go and people? tell you what I'm telling you today that you need to do something for somebody else that you need to put somebody else first that you need to not put yourself first where do you go where people say you trying to be more powerful, you trying to get higher, you trying to push yourself up is not the way to go but to begin to focus on other people is the way that you're supposed to go not, not only do you see that, that, it's, that it's born inside of us but, but you need to understand selfish ambition, it destroys love Look what James says here. And that's so much. Listen, the hardest part about these sermons has been narrowing it down to just a few slides that we can cover this stuff on. There are so many verses on selfish ambition, so many verses on pride, so many pr verses on putting others down in order for you to build yourself up. So many verses, so many stories in the Bible. But I think James does the best. He, he, go back and read James, his entire writing, but, but James does the best with it. He says, for where you have envy and what? Selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Let, let, let me just translate that for you for a second. If you have a problem with somebody, if you're having trouble with somebody, I, I can just about guarantee if you have an issue, you're having this issue, this contention between you and, and somebody that's close to you or somebody at work. If, if you're having an issue at home, if there's an issue between you and your kids, if there's an issue between you and your, your, your siblings, I can just about guarantee you with 99.9% .9 accuracy that the issue that you have has selfish ambition involved, involved in it. Because what, what James tells us is wherever you have selfish ambition, that's what if you got disorder going on, you can just about guarantee based on the Bible that selfish ambition is present. If you have evil, if folk are being mean to you, if malice there, I'm using the church word, if there's this issue where people are saying ugly things about you, if somebody's trying to push you down, or if you're trying to push somebody down, if something's going on at your job and it doesn't make sense and it becomes in the category of disorder. If there's an issue in your marriage and you can't put your finger on what it is, but it's just disorder and all kind of evil practices and all kind of mean things are being said and all kind of nasty stuff is happening in that situation, in that relationship, I can guarantee you selfish ambition is, in, is involved some way in it. Because selfish ambition, when you begin to understand how selfish ambition impacts love, you get to this place where you understand that when you have two people who are selfish, then, then, the, then this, you've got this toxic love. It's not real love. If you have two people in a relationship and both of the people are selfish, both of the people have this selfish ambition, both of the people want it their way. I don't care where you are. Be at a church. You can be at, listen, you can be at school. You can be in a classroom. You can be on the street. If you've got two people driving cars, and both of them want it their way. You got a toxic situation about to happen. If you got a one-lane street and two people are selfish on that one-lane street, let me tell you what's about to happen. You're about to have an accident. You're about to have a toxic situation that happens. And if you're raising children and both of you want your way, demand your way, got to have your way, neither one of you are willing to give up your own selfish ambition. Both of you are always saying, hey, this is the way it was when I was a kid. You got to do it this way. The other person is saying, this is the way it is. Now you're not a kid no more. Things are different. And both of you are holding on to your own selfish views. That's a toxic parental relationship. If you've got a sibling 
And both of you got, both of you want to be number one. Grandma put us up there, you know, I'm, I'm taking the place of all that kind of stuff. And there's two or three of you guys doing that. It destroys a family. It becomes a toxic environment. And listen to me as the, as the, as the next level kids, and all of us have been the next level kids, like you looking up at the people above you and you looking at them doing this kind of infighting in the family. This ain't nothing like what Big Mama did. This ain't nothing like what Grandmama and Granddaddy did. But there's this toxic thing that's happening. You understand like me that this selfish ambition, it destroys love. It causes for this toxic thing to happen, especially when both people are selfish. Now, now, now check this out. When one person is, is selfish and the other person is selfless, you got one person and all they have, it's got to be my way. It's got to be done the way I want it to be done. It has to be done. You're going to do it my way. I'm going to be first. You're going to be second. I'm going to take control. And you got another person that says, okay, I'm, I'm going to give myself to this. I'm going to do exactly what Jesus has told me to do. I'm going to live a life of humility. I'm going to put you first in that situation. You need to understand this. That relationship, that love is abusive. If you're in a relationship and you're constantly having to be the person to take that, what did it say? Take the high. Listen, both people need to be on the high road. It ain't no high and low road in a relationship. There's no high and low road in a marriage. There's no high and low road in parenting. When you with your sisters and your brothers, there's no high and low road. Everybody needs to be on the high road. And if you got a person that's constantly on the high road and a person that's constantly on the low road, what you have is abuse. And not just that. This is the only way that you can have love. This is why it is so important that we understand this. The only way that you can have the love that we're talking about, the only way that you can give the humility that Christ talks about, the only way that you can get rid of the John and James tendency, which is in each and every one of us, is that you get to this place where you are selfless and you are involved with people who are selfless, where two people come together. This is what we're after. This is the love that we're after. When there's a parent and a child, and they both put the other there's a contest I'm going to serve you more you I'm going to love you more I'm going to no 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 what do, what are we eating at and we do this me and my wife do this all the time this can be sometimes crazy what, what are we eating tonight I don't know what do you want I, whatever you want we're going to get whatever you want what do you well what do you want now, now where it gets off the train for us is one of us says well I want Burger King they'll say you want Burger King yeah, that's what God. Then we get back into that 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 selfish and and stuff. But 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 let me let's let me, let's stay focused. Let's stay focused. Stay focused. Let's stay focused. This is what we're after. We're after every marriage. This is what I'm praying. This is what I've been declaring throughout this series that every that every marriage be this agape love, real love, guys. Marriage, real love, guys, is what I'm after. This is what we're looking for. We're not looking to be selfish. Listen, this is the problem. Let me talk to my singles for a second. This is the problem. This is the problem. Every married person will tell you that many of us started off looking for a mate who, were gonna, who was going to do everything that we wanted, affirm us, agree with us, put us first. These are the things that we were saying. I'm looking for somebody that will put me first. That the, the entire thing is messed up. All the stuff that you're looking for. I'm looking for a person at this status. I want him to be dry or her to be. I want her to be driving this. I want her to have this. All those things on your list that point towards selfish ambition. I want them to have this so I can have more. All those things on your list. I'm, I'm not telling you just to go out and throw away your list and make bad decisions. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the motives of your heart. You should be looking at a person and you should be determined if that person is kind or not. You should be looking at a person and you, be try you should be trying to determine whether this person is patient or not. Do you know what it's like to be with a person that make a lot of money but they don't have any patience? Do you know what it's like to be with a person that has the job and the status and the house and the car that was on your list but they are not kind to you? They treat you like trash. They put themselves first. They put you second, maybe third behind the job. Job? This is a this is what we've been taught, and this is a mess. And the only way for us to get real love in a marriage, the only way for us to get real love in a parent relationship, the only way for you to fix, you got it. Listen, guy, I hear this because this has been a reoccurring theme inside of this this series. The only way for you to reconcile at any point, the only way for you to reconcile is that you have two people who are both selfless. You have two people that say, I own my part of the issue, I love you, you own your part of the issue, 
I love you for that. And now we're going to work together so that we can create this agape love and we can love and listen and we can have a marriage like we like no, we have the greatest marriage of all time or, or we can have we can be the goat. Right. We can, we can have this relation, this sibling relationship. The ones that, you know, you go around certain people and they be with their family. You're like, man, I wish my family the greatest family of all time. You've been to some of these places, some of these families. They're not putting on the front. It's great because they love each other. That's agape love. That's selflessness, not selfishness. If you want to be at work, you want to be this great person at work, this is how you do it. You have to get to this place where you are selfless and not selfish because nobody, nobody likes a selfish person. And I want you to see this for a second because listen to this. When the other disciples heard what these disciples asked Jesus, they got indignant. They got mad. They got upset because nobody likes a selfish person. Now, all of us might be selfish. We might be cool with being selfish, but nobody likes a person that's selfish. Nobody likes to be in a relationship with somebody who needs attention all the time. Nobody likes to be in a relationship with anybody who's always competing with you, who's always trying to push you down in order to put themselves up. Nobody wants to work with a person that always puts themselves first and then put everybody second. Nobody wants to be a part of a relationship with a person that is self-absorbed, who talks about themselves all the time, who brags all the time, who puts the needs of others second to their own, who always wants to figure out, how can I get more power? How can I get more control? How can I control the situation? How can I get more people to do this thing that I want them to do? And what Jesus does is he steps into our world and he changes the definition of what it means to be great. And he says, what, what, what you've been taught about, like, these people ruling over you and these people being in charge and these people telling people what to do and these people being the person that everybody have to come to in order for this thing to get done, in order for this thing to run. I, listen, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've worked with so many people who thought this until they got fired and the, banks, and the bank kept going. It's an amazing thing how people think because I've got the most time, because I've got the most knowledge, because I've got the biggest degree, because I am the I'm, I'm going to talk to my husband because I'm the man in the house. Because I'm the man. I'm first in the house. I'm, go, I'm the goat of this house. I'm the goat. I'm the priest of my house. This is what we say. I'm the goat of this house. I'm the greatest of all time in this house. And everybody in this house has to bow down to me and listen to me. You want to see a house that's in constant turmoil? Go to one where the, where the dad thinks he's the goat of the house, where he thinks he's the greatest dad of all time. And all he sees is what everybody else does wrong. And, and all he sees, is, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to me, right? I'm preaching to me. And, and what Paul says is, Paul says that th this greatest of all time thing, this goat thing, that this thing can't have nothing to do with love, that we have to get to this place where we understand that love does not dishonor others. It doesn't push anybody down. And, and matter of fact, it's not self-seeking. That, that love, this thing called love, we, we talked about this last week, it doesn't dishonor anybody. It doesn't put anybody down. It doesn't say mean or ugly things to a person. And he goes a step further. He doubles down on this thought. He says that it is not trying to get its way. It's not trying to always be right. It's not trying to always be in control. It's not trying to always tell people what to do. It's not trying to always put people in this place. It's not always trying to make itself number one. It's not always trying to get people to see it from their perspective. It's not this thing. Love is not this thing where, where we self-seek and we try to push ourselves up. And what he begins to communicate is this very important thing that will change every relationship that you're in. It'll change any relationship that you are in. He says that love has this thing in it called humility and, and that the self-seeking thing is the lack of humility that causes a person to be devoted or caring only for oneself. Have you ever been around a person who the only thing they talked about was a self? Have you ever been around a person where you can see, even, even as they're talking to you and it sounds like they're trying not to be selfish, that, that everything that they're saying ultimately comes back to them having more power, to them being more, having more authority over you, that everything that they talk about is what they can get, what more they can drive, what more. All their prayers, when they pray, it's all about, God, you know, you, I'm the head, not the, I'm above, but all that's right, that's fine. 
But, but you got to have some other prayers than just being made above and not beneath and ahead. Now, no, no, no. You got to have some other prayers for some other people. You need to be praying. This is, what, this is what he's saying. Love prays that the other person becomes above and not beneath. That the other person becomes the head. Even when you are the head, even when you are the man of the house, you're praying for your wife that God would make her the head and not the tail. That God would make her above and not beneath. You're looking at your children who you need, who you feel for whatever reason that you need to control and give hard love and tough love to and you look at them and you, you're saying over them and you're speaking over them that God will give them the, the ability to be above and not believe, beneath to be the head and not the tail and you take out everything about you like you don't pray down anybody you pray everybody up you know we tend to pray ourselves up and pray everybody else down God fix this person you God, God help this person. God change, change this person. And, and, and instead of asking God, listen, this is the person that you need to be praying for. You, you need to go to God and say, listen, I want to be the greatest of all time. And the only way I can be the greatest dad of all time, the only way I can be the greatest husband of all time, the only way I can be the greatest single of all time, the only way I can be the greatest sister, the greatest brother of all time is that you get this selfish ambition out of me, that you teach me this humility where I can stop focusing on myself and stop trying to make myself great and stop trying to you never get there you'll be chasing this for the rest of your life there'll be still people who will point out your faults right now you ask 10 people who's the greatest in this thing and the greatest in that thing everybody Muhammad Ali Mike Tice it all depends on how you feel and how you look at it the greatest of all time is something that you will never capture but you can strive to be the greatest of all time. And what Paul says is the way that we strive to be the greatest, especially when it comes to love, we get to this place where we take out anything that looks self-seeking, anything that doesn't look like humility, anything that looks like all we're thinking about is ourselves and what we get and how we're going to be impacted, anything that looks like we're primarily concerned with our own interests, anything that looks like we have no regard for the other people around us. He says, if you want to be great in love, this is how you do it and if you think about it this is exactly what Jesus says he doesn't say any matter of fact he not only does he say it but he actually lives it out in the moment many of us would have thought that potentially when these guys came to Jesus that Jesus would have put them in their place that Jesus would have said something profoundly mean but not you know nice in the Jesus way like make you feel real bad about convict you real bad but but this is what Jesus says he says no 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 I can't give this to you you've got to earn it and he says, I'm not going to just tell you that you have to earn it. I'm going to tell you how to earn it. I'm going to tell you, this is the way you earn it. You put others above you. This is the way you earn it. You serve others. This is the way you earn it. You put yourself last and put others before you. This is the way you earn it. He says, I cannot guarantee you that you'll be sitting at my right or my left because these are areas for the people who they're per per prepared for. These are areas for the people who earned them, the people who served others, the people who did everything the right way. But he, but he said, if you want to be great, if you want to be great in the kingdom, if you want to be close to me, if you want to be like me, if you want to be the dad that you wish that you had, if you want to be the mom that you wish that you had, if you want to be the single that you wish that you saw in this person, if you want to be the person at work that you really want to be, the way that you do that is by putting others first, by serving. You, you're talking about a way to get yourself promoted? Serve. You're talking about a way to get the attention of your boss? Don't walk in there talking a whole bunch of selfish ambition. The stuff that they tell you when you Google online, the stuff that everybody say about themselves, the stuff about how you are hard work. You know, then, then you get a little bit of, hu you think you have humility because they ask you, okay, well, tell me a negative thing about you. And you say something to the effect of, ah, well, I'm just such a hard worker. I just, I, when I get on a project... I just won't stop. I mean, I just keep on working. I, you just, that's not humility. That's you pushing yourself up even in that instance. And what he says is, if you want to be the sibling that, that you wish, you want things to be fixed, the way that we do it is through humility. And, and, and what Paul communicates to us, very simple thing. Humility matters. He, he, he teaches us. 
That, that the way that we look at other people, how we feel, the way that we put ourselves up, the way that we put up, if we put others up or we put ourselves up, he says that this matters, that this makes a difference. In, in not, not just in, in love, just not just in, in what's happening in between you and your, your wife or your mate or whatever, but he says this makes a difference in the kingdom, that, that this is what Christ did, this is what Christ is saying. This is what I did for you. I, I, I had this humility about myself. I, I could have at any point, I could have just called down legions of angels to destroy this place. But this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to have humility, not humbleness. Big difference between humbleness and humility. Humbleness, anybody can be humble. Just think about when you were a little kid. When your, when your mom and dad told you to shit, you kept talking, you, and they said, shut up. And don't say another word, and you humbled yourself, and you became humble, and you didn't say another word, but there was no humility. Your heart was not transformed. You did not begin to think differently. You did not say at that point, I'm going to put my little sister first. I, I, I know I'm right in this instance. She, if she'll just listen to me, she'll understand that Erica was the one that did it, but now she won't listen to me. You're not sitting there saying, you know what? You know what? She's right. Maybe, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I should put, put, put Erica first. Maybe I should put my, old, my sister first. No, no, no. What you're sitting there saying, you're seething, right? You're like, oh, my God, I'm so mad. Now I'm mad at mama. I was already mad at the sibling. Now I'm mad at mama because humbleness and humility are two different things. Humility is a heart condition. Humility is when you love people more than yourself. This is what we've been called to do. When, when they ask Jesus, they say, what is the, the number one commandment? This is what this series is about. He says, first of all, put God first, put others above you. And, and, and this is what you got to understand. We go back to those original verses and we start to look at without humility what this looks like. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have humility, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have humility, I am nothing. If I don't think about others, if all I think about is myself, doesn't matter. It, it goes a little bit further. He says, he says, if I give all I possess to the poor and give, all, uh, and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have humil humility. I'm just doing it for myself. He says, I gain nothing. And, and what he teaches us, he teaches us a very simple thing. He says that words without humility, they're just selfish. When we're talking and we're, we're not, we don't have any humility, it's always about us. We're always putting ourselves up. It's just selfish. He says that knowledge without humility is self-righteous. Everything that you say is only going to make you look like you're right. Everything you say is only going to make you look like you should be in charge. You should, you should be up top. He says faith without humility is self-absorbed. And this is what happens to a lot of people who lack humility. When they get into trouble, they, don't, they, they haven't really built a relationship with God in their life. It's all about what they did. It's all about their degrees. It's all about their position. It's never about God. And, and when you get into trouble, who do you turn to? You become self-absorbed. And he says that giving without humility is self-serving. That, that you only give just so you can get back. And it feels that way. When you, when you deal with a person that doesn't have humility and they give you something, you feel like, what I owe you? Why, you know, why you, what, what, now what, what are you, you know that you have received something that you're going to have to pay back in, in some way or another. And, and this is what P Peter begins to communicate. He, he, he says in, in verse 5, he, he says in, in chapter 5, verse 5, he says, all of you, you, you got to get to this place where you make humility matter. He says, you got to get to this place where you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Look what he says. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. This is the same thing Jesus says. He says, if you want to be great, humble yourself. If you want to be great, put other, fir other people first. If you want to be great, do whatever you can to serve other people. If you want to be great, it requires for you. You want to be the goat? You want to be the greatest of this? You want to be the greatest of that? It requires for you to have humility. Like there's no, when you sit down and you talk to CEOs of these big companies, when you look at what Amazon's doing, it's all about how do we serve people? How do we, how do we make it to where you don't have to go out your house anymore? We want to serve you. We want to, we want to do everything. We want, if you need something, we want to be there. We want to box at your door, no matter what you need. Need in two days, we'll get to you in two days. Need in one day, we'll get to you in one day. 
That's how he became the richest man, because he served. And when we look at any of these guys who have made it to the, the greatest of all times, the people who've been considered to be the greatest of all time, the one thing that they all have in common is that they served other people, that they put other people. They were good at what they did, surely, but, but their attention to others is, is what helped them to become the greatest of all time. So, so this is what you have to do this week. This is what I want you to do. I want you to get to this place where you make, and, and forever more, where you make humility uh, matters a priority in your life. And, and I want to just read. This is uh, some scripture. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read through this, but I'm going to ask you to go back to Philippians 2 at some point and, and really sit down with this word. But I just wanna, want you to understand this scripture. Paul writes this to the Philippian church. The Philippian church was the, the one knock that they had was they had a lot of selfish ambition. They had a lot of back and forth between, these, especially between these two ladies in the church, Sententia and, and Judea. They were just going back and forth, fighting each other, not f- literally fighting, but fussing and trying to turn each other. And it was literally tearing the church up. Selfish ambition was literally ch- tearing the Philippian church up. And Paul writes this beautiful letter to them. And this letter, if you just listen to this, this will change every relationship that you have. This will bring love into every situation. This, this will do it. If you just can grasp what Paul is getting ready to say to the, to the Philippian church and to us today. Look, look what he says. He says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any, com- if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same, same love, and one in the spirit, and of one mind. Just, just listen to this now. I get this now. He says that, 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 that if you love God, if, you, if you've had anything, he starts, if you have any encouragement from being in Christ, from experiencing what it means to be a Christian, if you bind into this love thing, this thing that Jesus did, which has loved us so much that he gave his life, if you got anything from that love, from the examples of Christ, from everything that we've been talking about in this series, from everything that you've been taught about Christ, if you understand, if you receive anything about that love, then you've got to get to this place where you set love as your goal, loving like Christ as your goal, to you, to you make it a priority inside of your life. You've got to get to this place where we love like Christ. He's saying every single one of us have to be the same love, this, this same spirit, the same mind. And what exactly is that love? What exactly is that spirit? What exactly is that mind? Look what he says. Do nothing. Got to make this a priority. Do nothing in your marriage. Do nothing with your children. Do nothing with your siblings. Do nothing at work. Do nothing in the community. Do nothing. I look this word nothing up, and it really means nothing, not nothing at all. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Throw away everything that you used to do to try and make yourself the greatest of all time. And, and let me tell you, what the main reason you throw it away because it never worked, and it never will work. You've been trying to do some of this stuff all your life, trying to push yourself up all your life, and, and it hasn't worked, and it's not going to work. It's, it's, it's zapping you of all your money. It's zapping you of all your time. It's bringing more hurt inside of your life. The, the, listen, listen to me. The, the thing that, you, that you've been trying to do for yourself, trying to push yourself up, it will never fill that hole in your heart. It will, it will never change anything. I know all the stuff that you said. If I just had this one thing, if I just had this one person, if I just had this, one, this thing to change, if I just made a little bit, ask these people who got promotions, and they realized you got a little bit more money, and then guess what? It went somewhere. You don't know where it went. It'll never be enough money. There'll never be a high enough position. It'll never be enough. You will never, ever get to the place where you are completely satisfied because selfish ambition is on the inside of you. And so what he says is, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, look what he says, in humility, make this a priority. Instead of doing things to lift you up, start to focus on other people. He says, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking for your own interests, but each of you, each married person, look for the interests of the other, each parent, each child, each sibling, everybody at work. Look, imagine what it would be like if we followed this. Imagine the abuse that'll go away. Imagine the toxic things that'll change inside of your life. Imagine the agape love that 
that would come in if we could just do this one thing in humility value others above yourself not looking for your own not looking for your own way not looking to exert power over people not looking to tell people what to do not looking to tell people what they did wrong not looking to prove to people that they need you that they can't live without you not looking to hurt somebody but you get to this place where you put others interests above your own he says you got to make it a priority humility has to be the mission we have to want it instead of you trying to be the goat instead of you trying to be the greatest instead of you trying to exert your power instead of you trying to be in charge instead of you trying to control everybody you get to this place where you try to serve and help everybody and, and then he goes a little bit further he, he says make it your identity in in relationship with one another look what he says make it your identity have the same mindset as that mindset of Christ Jesus. He, said, he says, in everything that you do, do it like Christ. Like, like what, would, what would Jesus do? You remember those old bands? Like literally, whenever you're in a situation and you feel yourself trying to pop up, you begin to take on the mindset that literally this word means the attitude. This becomes your identity. People begin to see you as not a divisive person, not a person who always has to have their way, not as a selfish person, not as a person who when you don't do this thing like they want you to do it. You, some of you know what I'm talking about. You got people like this around you. When you don't do this thing like they want you to do it, then I, okay, I'm, I'm gone. I'm done with you. I'm, I'm, you ain't going to make it and all these mean things begin to spew out of them. He says, we got to get to this place where our identity becomes that of Christ. And, and he just doesn't leave us. I like, I like how Paul writes this. He, he gives us the detail. He says, who being in the very nature of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Got to see this now. He's saying this was God in the flesh. But he didn't see the fact that he was God, that he had, he didn't see the fact that he had the degree. He didn't see the fact that he was the man of the house. He didn't see the fact that he had the position. He didn't see the fact that he was the older sibling. He didn't see the fact that he was the uncle or the, or the auntie. He didn't see that he had an advantage over the person as something that he would use for himself, but rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being uh, made in human likeness. He says, instead of me using my advantage over you, instead of me having this focus where I'm just self, self, I've got this self ambition, I'm selfish, I, I just want things my way, and I can have things my way because I've got power over the situation. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let go of my power. I'm going to let go of my position. I'm going to let go of my degrees. I'm going to let go of whatever it is that I need to let go so that I can serve you, so that I can help you. So that I can sit down, imagine that, a boss sitting down with you and saying, I'm putting aside all of my, all the levels I am, all everything, all my experience. Now, how can I help you make this job better? How can I help you serve the customer better? He says, listen, he got down to the fact, where he, to the place where he became a human like this. And look what he says. This is how you become the goat. He says, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He says, if you want to, to really be, have humility, you can't have humility if you're constantly pushing yourself up, if you're constantly talking about that you, what you own, what you're in charge of, if you're constantly talking about what other people have to do in order to please you, if you're constantly talking about your own accomplishments and not other people's accomplishments, if you constantly focus on yourself, if your words, if your faith, if everything you believe is about you, if you're, if it, listen, if you don't get your way and now all of a sudden you are so tore up and upset what he's saying is humble yourself and then he says not just humble yourself but get to this place of obedience obedient with what listen obedient with the number one commandment of all love God first love others second love yourself third obedient to what to death to the place where you're willing to sacrifice for somebody even death on the cross. And, and, and look what happens. Look what happens. Look what happens. Amazing thing, because this is what Jesus explained earlier. This actually happened to him. He says, therefore, now God understand, anytime you see this word, therefore, you have to ask the question, why is it therefore? Be because of all that stuff that he just talked about, because of all that humbleness, because of all that sacrifice, all that obedience, because of that, God did what? Exalted him. God, God made him the goat. Be because he was able to humble himself, because he was able to be obedient, because he sacrificed, because he put others first, because he looked out for others' interests, because he had 
humility instead of selfish ambition. God, listen, he exalted him and he will exalt you to it. You, you got to get this. This is a principle. This is not just, well, look, that was Jesus. And no, 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 no. This is a principle of life that plays out constantly. If you sit down and you just begin to talk to the people who, who made it to the highest levels or whatever, you talk to Oprah Winfrey. You sit down and you talk to any of these people. You begin to understand that they became the greatest of all time because they served. Because they humbled themselves, because they put others first, because they made the people, the other people on the team better, because they, 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 they did the thing that needed to happen, and, or they sacrificed, they were obedient, they had this obedience about themselves, they loved others so much that they worked hard, not to just push themselves up, but so that they wouldn't let other people down. Yeah. He, he says, Be, because of this thing. That he was given a name that was above all every name, that at the name of Yeshua, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. Got to get this. This is what happens now. Check this out now. He does the opposite of what we've been taught to do. He, he puts other people first. He got, got to see this now. Th this man who didn't have any degrees, <laughs> it's this, he was just a, a stonemason, right? We say, uh, we say he was a carpenter, but really there's no wood in this area. He really would have been more like a stonemason. We're talking about Yeshua now. Yeah. This, this man who grew up, he didn't grow up in this rich neighborhood with this, all this money or this power or any of the stuff that we want. He, he more than likely didn't wear a certain name brand sheep. He more than likely didn't have any of the stuff that we use in order to determine that we are the greatest of all time. He had no, he, he wasn't over in it. I mean, he had a small little church. It was like 12 people. And when, that, when they all got together with all their families and everybody, and little kids and everybody, maybe 125 people, he didn't have this mega ministry. I know, you know, and a lot of this stuff happens inside of our world. We, we brought this stuff over into the church. This isn't what it was about. It was this guy. He never probably went 500 miles outside of his house. He didn't have this resume of traveling the world and how wonderful and how great he was. He didn't have this. He didn't try to exert any authority, although he could have. You got to understand this. He gets to this place where he becomes humble, where he puts others first, where he is obedient, where, where, where he sacrifices himself. And this is what God does. God makes him the goat. God, God makes him the goat. And, and what he tells us today is, if you want to be the greatest of all time, it doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what church you go to. It doesn't matter how long you've been married. It doesn't matter how bad the marriage is right now. It doesn't matter how long you've been a parent. It doesn't matter how bad the parent relationship is right now. He says that there's an That's what I love about Jesus' definition of greatness. Because there's an opportunity. It doesn't have anything to do with how many letters you have in front or behind your name. It doesn't have anything to do with what school you went to. It doesn't have anything to do with what you drive. It doesn't have anything to do where you live, what kind of house you live on. He says, if you want to be great, if you want to be the greatest of all time, the only thing that you need to do is to put others first. Love people. Serve others. Don't, don't try to make people serve you. Be humble. Get to this place where you're obedient. Obedient to what? To loving God, loving others, sacrifice for people. This is what he says. If you want to be the greatest of all time, the only thing you need to do is Love unselfishly. And people will remember you for the rest of your life. You, you touch somebody's life with unselfish love. You touch somebody. You, listen to me. When, when people see your marriage, got to hear this, and, and they see unselfish love between you and, and, and your mate, then they begin to say, this thing is possible. I can find somebody. I can, I can, have, that. I can have that marriage. And in their mind, you become the greatest marriage of all time. When people see the way you raise a child and you are unselfish with that child, you're not trying to lord over that child, you're not trying to push, you don't insult that child, you don't beat that child down, but you love them unselfishly, you love them with humility. People say, I wish I had a mama like that. I wish I had a dad like that. When people see how you sit down with your employees or how you work for your boss, they begin to say, you know, you, you, that's awesome. That's, that person don't deserve you. That, that's what they begin to say. That's what they begin to see. Single people. When people around you, when they begin to see 
how unselfish you are. You'll be surprised at the level in which you arise. And, and listen, it's from that perch of unselfishness that the man or the woman that you're waiting for will see you. Right now, they can't see you. I'm, I'm speaking to somebody. I hope you receive it. They can't see you because you're doing all the things that push you down instead of the thing that takes you to the top. But when you stop putting your own selfish ambition first, you'll be perched high. And the person that you're looking for, the person that's been looking for you will see you. And you will have a love based on unselfish living. And it'll be a godly love that we all will look to and say, hey, I'm speaking this over somebody. That's the greatest love we've ever seen. I want you to take some time. I ask you two questions every week. Here's the first question. What is God saying to you about your own selfish ambition? Take a look at your life. Take a look at, <laughs> for some of us, go to online banking and look at what you pay out every month. How much of what you have, how much debt you have, how much of the, mis the mistakes, the decisions that you've made to be competitive and have a house or drive a certain car, or do a certain thing, how much of that is the result of, of this selfish ambition? What, what about the things that you're doing? What is God saying to you about this, what, about how you put yourself first, about how you put your family above others, about how you put your children above other ch I know this is crazy talk, right? But, but what Jesus is saying is humility requires that you put Somebody else's child above your child. That's a humility test, right? Many of, us can't, many of us can't do that right now. Can't put somebody else's child's needs above our own child's needs. Yeah, that's what humility does. Humility says that I'm going to spend time with other people's children instead of just spending a whole lot of waste. It'd be a lot of wasted time, just a whole lot of wasted time with my children. But I'm going to actually pour into somebody's life who may not have had a mother, may not have had a father. That, that's what being the greatest of all time does. What is God saying to you today? Here's the second question. What would your life be like? Oh, imagine it. See, I can see things right now. I see marriages being restored right now. Can you imagine your marriage? Can you imagine your marriage if you can get this piece in? I'm talking about this, this unselfish thing into your marriage. It's not about each other's way and each other getting their way. Can you imagine? I'm talking to parents. Can you imagine your parenting? What it would be like if you two can sit down and get on the same one accord. Remember, it, got, it takes people getting on the one accord. Two people on the high road. Two people serving each other. Siblings. What would this be like? This, this been a gulf between you and this person, this family member. What would it be like if you both can get up on a higher plane and begin to be unselfish? And what can God do with that? I want you just to imagine what it would be like at, at work if you can just master this thing where you begin to serve people and you begin to be known as the greatest person at work for the work that you do. Uh, be, be, because God is getting ready to to do that very thing. If you can just let this penetrate your heart, if you can get rid of selfish ambition and you can begin to move toward a life of unselfishness and humility. So, so, so this week, this week, it, this is what I want you to focus on. Got to get this, guys. I will make humility the mission, not my selfish ambition. I'm actually going to do something big this week. I'm actually going to let go of all the stuff that's been hurting you. That's this, you think that letting go of this stuff is, is, is going to put you back or, or, or cause you not to get what you want. No, 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 no. You let go of this stuff and then God will exalt you. God says, I, I can't help you the way where you are because you're too proud because you're trying to do too much. You're trying to, you're trying to be too, you try, you're not humble. You're not, you don't have humility. I can't help you. I can't exalt you right there. But he's saying that if you make humility your mission, then I can lift you up. I can exalt you. I can take you to the place. I can make you the greatest of all time. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.